Report of a fire. Engine 9. Medic 8. So I'm going to go through them in order for you, highlighting the changes that we've made and uh, hopefully being able to answer any of the questions that might come up with these protocol changes. So we're going to start out with 070001, which is the limited medical uh, treatment plan. And it was suggested in protocol committee that to this particular SOP, we also attach the actual form for the comfort care and comfort care arrest and exactly what the form looks like and what you can and cannot do. So the only change to that SOP is that you will have attached the actual forms uh, to refer to when you treat someone who's a DNR comfort care or DNR comfort care arrest. So that's a real simple change on that SOP. The next one we'll talk about is 070013, which is our general transport policy. And this is a more uh, a major change for our protocol. And what we're going to be doing is allowing you as the paramedic to make the decision on the closest appropriate hospital that you take a patient to. So this is a lot of responsibility on you to make the decision that will benefit the patient the best. And so here's how it's worded. It basically says that uh, if the patient chooses to be transported by the Division of Fire Personnel, then CFD personnel will initiate the transport based on the closest appropriate hospital. Now, that's going to leave a lot of leverage in your hands as the paramedic to make that decision. The closest appropriate hospital emergency department means the geographically closest hospital emergency department that can offer the most appropriate care in the patient's best interests. So there's a lot of subjectivity to that that you're going to have to interpret and uh, determine what that facility will be. So attention should be given if a patient has been treated at a certain hospital recently or if their physician of record has a professional relationship with a particular hospital. For example, if that patient had surgery at a hospital recently and has post-operative complications, then EMS personnel should make every effort to transport that patient to their requested hospital if they're medically stable. If a patient is medically stable and wants to be transported to a hospital emergency department that is not the geographically closest one, but their physician of record practices at that facility, then the patient should be transported to the farther location. And finally, the patient's medical condition takes precedence over their destination preference. So, if they're unstable, in the opinion of the transporting EMS personnel, then they should be taken to the closest hospital emergency department that can take care of their immediate medical and or surgical need and then be secondarily transferred to their facility of choice once stabilized. So instead of the patient determining the hospital that they will go to, you as the paramedic will make the determination that is in the patient's best interest. Now here's some transport scenarios that kind of go along with this SOP change to kind of give you an idea in terms of what we're trying to get across with this change. So, Medic 17 runs on a 62-year-old female on Sullivan Avenue who is having abdominal pain for the last two days. She recently had gallbladder surgery at Mount Carmel East and her surgeon practices there. She wants to go to Mount Carmel East. She is medically stable. Where should they transport her? The answer is to Mount Carmel East where she had her surgery. Medic 19 runs on a 42-year-old male on East North Broadway who's having chest pain. They do a 12 lead EKG and determine that he's having an ST elevation MI or a STEMI. His blood pressure is 80 over 60 and he's having runs of ventricular tachycardia. He says he wants to go to Mount Carmel St. Anne's because he wouldn't take his dog to Riverside. Mount Carmel St. Anne's is 10 minutes farther away than Riverside is. Where do they transport him? 
The answer is Riverside, because that's the closest, most appropriate place for him to go. And his condition is unstable, so he could not uh, warrant uh, the decision to be transported to a farther location in those circumstances. Medic 14 runs on a 28-year-old female who's having a headache. She says this is her typical migraine headache and that she normally goes to Grant the last time, though, they didn't give me the pain meds that I wanted. Grant Hospital is 10 minutes away. She has stable vital signs and does not appear to be in any distress. She wants to go to Dublin Methodist because I've never been there before. Where should they transport her? The correct answer is to Grant because that's the geographically closest place where she can theoretically get the most appropriate treatment. Medic 33 runs on a 20-year-old female in her OBGYN doctor's office on Polaris Parkway. She's six months pregnant and her OBGYN physician has examined her and wants her to be transported down to Grant where he practices so he can do some tests. She's stable and has normal vital signs and is, no, and is in no imminent delivery. Where should they transport her? The answer is to Grant. She's medically stable, her physician of record is at Grant, and her physician wants her to go there. So Grant is the appropriate place for her to go. Finally, Medic 11 runs on a 65-year-old male who is in his cardiologist's office on Bethel Road. He has just had an EKG done and the cardiologist is concerned about some subtle changes that he sees. He wants the patient transported down to OSU Maine where he practices for a cardiac catheterization. While the patient is being loaded onto the medic vehicle, the patient clutches his chest and says that the pain has become much worse. Medic 11 does another 12 lead and now notices the STEMI. Where should they transport the patient? The correct answer is to Riverside, which is geographically closer and is the most appropriate medical facility for this patient to be taken. So hopefully that gives you the nuance of what we're trying to get across here. We will be monitoring this to see how well we're uh, providing the most appropriate destination for patients and we'll be seeing if uh, this policy change will result in a better care for our patients. All right, moving on. We have a new SOP, which is 070036, which is EMS equipment replacement. In the past, we've had some frustrations with making sure that we get our EMS equipment replaced and properly accounted for. So this SOP actually puts the responsibility for this in the EMS officer's hands. And so what will be done is that the EMS officers will be uh, responsible for taking any kind of broken equipment or for getting lost equipment uh, properly uh, accounted for, uh, the ET68s filled out. And so this is just an administrative type of form that will uh, airmark the EMS officer for the responsible person for making sure that re EMS equipment is replaced and accounted for. All right, SOP number 070204 for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. The only change on this is that we've added fentanyl as another drug that can be used for sedation. And that would also go along with uh, SOP 070205, which is ventricular tachycardia. We have added fentanyl as a drug that you can give for sedation along with Versed. 070209, acute pulmonary edema, CHF. We have removed captopril as a treatment option. Uh, we tried captopril for a year and a half, and unfortunately it did not appear to be providing any benefit for the patient. It was difficult to administer. The patients uh, complained of the powder as far as the crushed pill being in their mouth when their mouth's already dry. Didn't appear to be providing any kind of uh, uh, therapeutic benefit for patients. So we're eliminating that. We are in our protocol committee uh, discussing the use of another ACE inhibitor called enalapril that you can give in an IV form. So that may be a protocol change you'll see in January for 2014. Uh, all right, moving on here. This is another very important change that we've enacted for uh, our protocol, and that would be 070711, and that is cervical spine clearance. Uh, in the past, we have been uh, pretty aggressive 
in uh, taking any patient who sustained head trauma or neck trauma and actually putting a cervical collar on them and putting them on a backboard. The trend right now, based on some scientific studies and other uh, thinking among a specialist in surgery and emergency medicine, is that uh, this is not necessary in the vast majority of cases. And one of the documents that we've used to um, uh, craft our SOP is a position statement from the National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons uh, Committee on Trauma. And basically, uh, they make the following points. Long backboards are commonly used to attempt to provide rigid spinal immobilization among emergency medical services trauma patients. However, the benefit of long backboards is largely unproven. And this is true. The science has shown that putting people on backboards does not necessarily prevent uh, spinal cord injuries and, in fact, might actually be harmful for patients. The long backboard can induce pain, patient ag agitation, and respiratory compromise. Further, the backboard can decrease tissue perfusion at pressure points, leading to the development of pressure ulcers. Utilization of backboards for spinal mobilization during transport should be judicious so that the potential benefits outweigh the risks. So the appropriate patients that should be immobilized with a backboard may include the following. Blunt trauma and altered level of consciousness, spinal pain or tenderness, neurologic complaints such as numbness or motor weakness, anatomic deformity of the spine, high energy mechanism of injury and any of the following, drug or alcohol intoxication, inability to communicate, or a distracting injury. So in our protocol change, we've kind of incorporated those caveats. We have eliminated the uh, flow chart uh, that takes you down the different yes, no questions and put it all on one page. So we're hoping that it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, easy for you to follow. But uh, patients for whom immobilization on a backboard is not necessary include those with all the following. Normal level of consciousness, that is a Glasgow Coma Scale of 15. No spine tenderness or anatomic abnormality. No neurologic findings or complaints. No distracting injury. No intoxication. And uh, patients with penetrating trauma to the head, neck, or torso and no evidence of spinal injury should never be immobilized on a backboard or have a cervical collar placed. So we're going to be a lot more stringent in terms of who we actually put on a backboard and who we put a cervical collar on. And we're hoping that this will eliminate those patients that are really normally uh, walking around after a car accident and uh, we do the takedown on them where we kind of take them down on the board, put the collar on, and. Uh, we're trying to eliminate those kinds of patients where really this is not going to be beneficial for them. So that's a major change in our protocol. All right, moving on, SOP number 070301. Uh, this is on multiple trauma. This basically relates back to the cervical spine uh, SOP changes. So in uh, B here, we talk about cervical spine injury and control should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. We refer you back to 070711 for guidance. And the same is true for neurologic trauma, which is 070304, uh, where we refer you back to that uh, uh, SOP for cervical spine control. A couple of other things, though, uh, which I'll refer to in a minute, but we uh, do have a new protocol called medication-assisted endotracheal intubation. And this is something that you can refer back to in the neurologic trauma SOP. And I'll go over that in a minute. And then we've also added Zofran as a drug that you can give for nausea and vomiting in patients that have neurologic trauma. So those are the changes there. Um, facial trauma, the only change we made with this, that's 070305, is that we just say that nasal intubation or King LT placement absolutely contraindicated in unstable mid-face fractures. Ocular trauma, uh, I think we've added Grant, Mount Carmel West, or Ohio State University as um, destination uh, facilities for ocular trauma. The Lucas device, this is uh, again a result of a firefighter uh, who suggested uh, or asked the question, why can't we use the Lucas device in a trauma arrest? And I couldn't really answer that, so I went back and did some research and found out that you actually can use the Lucas device in a trauma arrest. 
And so we've actually taken that out of a contraindication in terms of using it. So you can use the Lucas device in a trauma arrest now. Okay, the new protocol we're referring to, which we haven't even labeled yet uh, or given a number to yet, but it's the medication-assisted endotracheal intubation. And this is a uh, uh, endeavor from uh, Tim Gifford uh, and also our EMS fellow, Dr. Eric Cortez. And Tim basically brought the uh, issue up to me in terms of what are the two best drugs to use for assisting in an endotracheal intubation in terms of sedation. And what his research search found and what we did corroborate with him is that uh, those two drugs are Versed and fentanyl. So we've included your medication uh, suggestions for Versed and fentanyl for someone that you would like to use medication on to help to assist you in your endotracheal intubation. With ketamine being kind of a backup drug if your EMS officer is on scene. So this is a brand new um, uh, SOP. I think it's really good in terms of helping us with those difficult intubations and gives you some guidelines as far as what medicines to use, how much of them to use, and when you should use them in those patients who are very difficult to intubate. Okay, we have some uh, a, a collection here of uh, SOPs that deal with epinephrine administration. So that would be our anaphylaxis SOP 070212. It would include our um, asthma COPD uh, SOP 070219. And then uh, 070513, which is pediatric anaphylaxis. And the only thing we're trying to make a point of here is that the epinephrine that you give should be IM and not sub Q. IM epinephrine is much preferred because the absorption is much better, especially if you're not perfusing your periphery well if you're in shock from anaphylaxis. So we are uh, uh, suggesting or mandating that when you give your epinephrine, you give it IM instead of sub-Q. We should not be giving any sub-Q epinephrine because the absorption rates are so much better with an intramuscular administration of epinephrine. And then finally, the last SOP change is uh, for uh, DKA or hypoglycemia. And this was another uh, suggestion from a firefighter, John Schroeder, who said that, you know, if their sugar is 80 uh, or below and they refuse to go to the hospital, you know, what are our options? So we talked about that, about that in protocol committee and we thought that maybe 80 was too high of a number to uh, actually use as a cutoff for de determining whether a patient was able to make a proper judgment. So what we've done here with this protocol change is that we have talked about 60 being the number now, the cutoff. And so if uh, transport's required when blood sugar is below 60 and you've already given glucagon, because glucagon is a very slow acting medication, the patient's taking oral hypoglycemics like metformin or something like that where those drugs are also very slow acting and the patient could become more hypoglycemic over time. The patient is alone and has no caregiver. The patient's disoriented and unable to make reasonable judgments. In those cases, it's always good to get your EMS officer involved to try to persuade the patient to go to the hospital and uh, they can kind of run interference for you to make sure that uh, the best interest of the patient is met. So. Um, so that's the change that we've made with uh, uh, that particular um, uh, SOP. And so again, we thank Firefighter Schroeder for bringing this to our attention. All right, now we're going to talk about our protocol for CVA and TIA, uh, cerebrovascular accident or a transient ischemic attack. And this is SOP number 070213. So the first thing is to make sure that the patient has a patent airway and administer 100% uh, oxygen via non-rebreather mask. And if you need to, go ahead and put in some sort of definitive airway as is an endotracheal tube or a uh, King LT. You would want to perform any kind of C-spine immobilization for any patient who meets the criteria and is uh, unconscious with potentially suspected head trauma. 
So determine, if possible, when the last time the patient was seen as neurologically normal. Many times this is difficult, especially if the patient notices these symptoms when they wake up in the morning. But try as best that you can to get an hour definition of when the patient was last seen as neurologically normal and make sure you document that on the chart and relate that to the uh, respective receiving emergency department. Now you'll want to use your LAM score or the Los Angeles Motor Scale to give a numerical grading of the uh, particular symptoms the patient is experiencing. And that's in your protocol also and it has a couple of different things that you measure. One is the facial weakness, which is either absent, which is a zero, or present, which is a one. Arm weakness, which is either absent, which is a zero. If they're drifting, where you ask them to lift up their arms like this, close their eyes, and if they start to drift like that, that's a positive sign for drift, and that's a numerical value of one. And then if they fall rapidly, where you ask them to try to hold their arms up and they just can't seem to hold them up at all, that's a numerical value of two. And then finally, grip strength. Either it's absent, which is a zero, weak, which is very subjective, that's a one, or no grip at all. I'm sorry, I got those backwards. Normal, where they actually grip your fingers, that would be a zero. Weakness is a one and then no grip at all, that is a two, okay? So that's the land score. You can re go ahead and add those numbers up and give that numerical score to the receiving emergency department. Now, here's the important uh, stuff as far as destination. Patients with signs of stroke and last time seen normal, less than four hours should be taken to the following emergency department. <clears throat> and they include Grant Medical Center, Mount Carmel East and West, Mount Carmel St. Anne's, OSU East, OSU Wexner Medical Center, and Riverside Methodist Hospital. These are patients that we do not feel, according to the scientific evidence, that they would benefit from any direct interventional uh, therapies. And so these patients can be taken to these primary accredited stroke centers. Now, if they're last seen normal over four hours, then the thinking may be that they would benefit from an interventional maneuver or uh, technique. And so we ask you to take those patients who were last seen neurologically normal after four hours to the following emergency departments. And they include Mount Carmel East and West Hospital, OSU Wexter Medical Center, and Riverside Methodist Hospital. All these facilities have the uh, capabilities of doing interventional techniques for stroke. You always want to obtain your medical history and the medication the patient is on, especially blood thinners. And uh, you want to go ahead and hyperventilate the patient to achieve an end tidal CO2 reading of about 35. Uh, if their vital signs are deteriorating or you see signs of impending herniation, such as a fixed blown pupil on one side, that would indicate that they're actually herniating, and so hyperventilating would be indicated. But without those signs, you don't want to hyperventilate the patient. You'll want to start an IV if you're able to, and just keep it at a TKO rate and don't administer large amounts of fluid to the stroke patient. Uh, you can use the unaffected arm, in other words, the arm that doesn't appear to be the weak arm or the paralyzed arm on the patient uh, so to not interfere with the neurologic exams. You'll want to try to obtain a blood sample and perform a glucose analysis because hypoglycemia can actually mimic stroke symptoms. So you'll want to make sure the patient is not hypoglycemic uh, and doesn't need treatment for that. In patients with decreased level of consciousness of unknown etiology, then you always want to consider opiate overdose or misuse, and so you'll want to administer Narcan 0.4 milligram to 2 milligram IV. You can also administer Narcan through the mucosal atomizer device or the MAD device. And finally, if you have an ET tube down, you can actually give the Narcan down the ET tube. You do not want to treat hypertension 
in a patient who has signs of a stroke or a TIA. You do not want to administer aspirin to any patient because of the risk of intracerebral bleeding that may occur in these patients. Now, if they're unconscious and there's no obvious signs of any kind of trauma, you can transport patient, the patient with the head slightly elevated. If conscious, you can transport in a position of comfort. Patients with suspected CVA or TIA should always be transported on a cardiac monitor. A 12 lead EKG should be performed and uploaded into the electronic PCR and consider transmitting that report if you see any signs of abnormalities on the EKG to the receiving emergency department. An extensive radio report to your receiving emergency department will help to facilitate the admission of the patient to their stroke facility and to uh, start the stroke uh, team to be able to respond to the patient. So your radio report should indicate the patient's current level of consciousness, headache or dizziness, existence of facial droop or unilateral weak hand grip, an unstated gait if known, and obviously patient's last known neurologically normal uh, time. And any kind of use in anticoagulants is also uh, a good thing to indicate on your radio report. And I want to encourage you as we end these protocol changes that if you have any kind of, uh, you know, uh, concern or question or suggestion as far as protocol changes, we have quarterly protocol committee meetings that anybody is welcome to come to. And if you're interested, I'll put you on the mailing list for those. And you're welcome to come and give your thoughts because a lot of the things that are really good out there for protocol and for patients we don't know about because you're the ones on the front lines and you'll be able to tell us if something's working, something's not working. So you're always welcome to come to those protocol committee meetings. They're in January, April, July, and October, usually the fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. in room 218. And so email me at dkesig, D-K-E-S-E-G, at columbus.gov, and I'll be happy to put you on the mailing list. But aside from even coming to the protocol committee meetings, if you have something come up with protocol, make sure and email me, give me your concern. I'll either explain to you why we do it, or I'll say, hey, you know, that's a really good idea. Maybe we should do it the way that you're suggesting. And that's been one way that we've actually been able to make our protocol better. So thanks for paying attention to all this. And uh, I hope these protocol changes uh, work to make your job easier and more uh, efficient. And uh, if you have any questions about it, please email me and let me know.